It's uh, first of all, it gives me great pleasure to welcome Grace Anita Ali. Um, she is Assistant Professor of Art and Public Policy at Tisch School for the Arts at NYU, a curator and editor. Her curatorial research practice focuses on socially engaged contemporary art practices. She is the founder and editorial director of Off Note magazine, an award-winning non-profit arts journalism initiative reporting on the intersection of arts and politics and global arts activism. She is the recipient of the NYU Provost Faculty Fellowship, Paul Mellon Center for Studies in British Art Grant, Andy Warhol Foundation for the Visual Arts Curatorial Fellowship, Fulbright Fellowship, and is a World Economic Forum Global Shaper. Thank you. Nor is it through any fault of his own, 
The invisibility of Ellison's protagonist is a result of our resistance to see him. We, the viewer, are the perpetrators of invisibility. Broadly speaking, another subtext running throughout the novel is this questioning of why and how we can be invisible to each other. Ellison's invisible man asks us to confront our own blindness, to examine how we participate, knowingly or unknowingly, in rendering others invisible. The protagonist beckons us to see him. Beyond his appearance, beyond his skin color, beyond his physicality, beyond the codes and cues that society marks him with, and instead recognize him as an individual with depth, with complexity, with humanity, with a vast interior life. And this is why this 1952 novel continues today to resonate in universal ways. As an aside, the book has been through 37 printings since 1952, and translated in over 15 languages worldwide. It continues to resonate today as it captures, I think, the singular desire we all share to be seen, to be seen as whole, complicated, contradictory, beautiful, and flawed human beings trying to make sense of what at times is quite a daunting and terrifying world. In our 21st century world, the book's commingling themes of displacement, alienation, and visibility has found a new kind of reading in classrooms for students encountering the novel for the first time and has received newfound resonance within communities who are extremely vulnerable in our current political climate and living in the shadows. That is, the you undocumented know, immigrant and the refugee. In writing The Invisible Man, Ellison was also calling attention to encountering the invisibility of African Americans in literature, how they were seen, and perhaps more importantly, not seen, in a canon of American literature authored largely by white men. In his 1953 essay, 20th Century Fiction and the Black Mass of Humanity, Ellison reflected on the novelists of his time, like Hemingway, Steinbeck, and early Faulkner, writing that they seldom conceived, quote, black characters possessing the full, complex ambiguity of the human, and fell short in constructing a black man as that sensitively focused process of opposites, of good and evil, of instinct and intellect, of passion and spirituality, which great literary art has projected as the image of man. Ellison's Invisible Man was a direct rebuttal to absent or one-dimensional portrayals of black characters in literature. At the time of its publication in 1952, Life magazine wrote that it was the most compelling story of, quote, the loneliness, the horror, and the disillusionment of a man who has lost faith in himself and his world. In other words, it's a story of a human being human. He fought to keep the title of the work knowing that it might be compared to or confused with H.G. Wells' 1897 science fiction novel, The Invisible Man. And um, Ellison's novel quickly became one of the most acclaimed literary works of the 20th century, winning the National Book Award for Fiction in the United States in 1953, <coughs> among other numerous honors and accolades. Invisible Man, as I, I shared earlier, is Ellison's only complete novel. It also took him seven years to write. And during that time, he became increasingly drawn to the history of art. He was a lifelong student of art. In fact, before Ellison became a writer, he had aspirations to be a sculptor. And when he arrived in New York in 1936, it was the world of black artists living in Harlem that he found himself immersed in. As he shaped and formed the layers of this ambitious metaphor of invisibility, as he attempted to convey in language and prose the breadth, scope, and complexity of African-American life of his time, he turned frequently to visual art. In tandem, the novel has been quite attractive to visual artists, because it is teeming with 
superficial, our references, our theory, our history, lengthy analyses of portraiture, museum scenes, and references to artists of Ellison's time or historical artists who he was studying. It is not surprising that in the six decades since the book was published, visual artists have found Invisible Man compelling. Many artists have mined Ellison's themes and concepts, deconstructing the nuances of invisibility. But it might have been Ellison himself who set the precedence and ignited the interest of visual artists to engage their art making with the novel. Most notably is Ellison's collaboration with Gordon Parks, the noted photojournalist and first African-American staff photographer for Life magazine. In 1952, on the occasion of the publication of the novel, the two men collaborated under a shared belief in the power of photography to communicate the racial injustices of the time. Living in Harlem since the 1940s and while working on Invisible Man, Ellison had begun to nurture his own growing interest in photography, particularly in portraiture. He often photographed the people of Harlem. He took on several freelance photography gigs, and his archives, interestingly, revealed that he had gone so far as to design letterhead, denoting himself as Ralph Ellison, photographer. He greatly admired Gordon Parks' work, which was rooted in the agenda that photography had the power to affect social change by making injustice visible. With Gordon Parks photographing scenes illuminating the social and economic conditions for African Americans in Harlem, and Ellison writing the text, the two published this, a three-page photo essay titled, A Man Becomes Invisible for the August 25th, 1952 issue of Life magazine, the most popular magazine in the United States at the time. And this is um, courtesy of the Gordon Parks Foundation, who has put a tremendous amount of Parks' archives online, including on Google Arts and Culture, um, which you can access online. The feature which offered a sobering portrait of black life in America was also meant to coincide and promote the release of Invisible Man and functioned as both a tribute to an official interpretation of the novel. The lead evocative image seen here was that of a black man emerging from beneath a manhole cover on the street. Invo it invokes the climax of the novel where Ellison's protagonist falls through a manhole while being chased by police during a ride in Harlem. The police cover the manhole and tra trap him underground. He stays underground to contemplate how to rejoin a society that has shunned him. To tease out the sense of displacement and entrapment and alienation in the novel, and I've, I've shown, I'm showing you the contact sheet from Gordon Parks' archive where you can see here the image that finally made um, the final cut in the publication in Life magazine. In these staged and performative portraits of a man struggling to be seen and to survive, Parks chose to emphasize a psychological narrative rather than a documentary one. It bears noting, however, and here's the catch, that after the four image spread was published in Life magazine, Ellison wrote to his friend and fellow writer Richard Wright in 1953 expressing disappointment not with the content of the images as much as the form. He wrote to write, quote, being a photographer and a writer, you will appreciate the tremendous difficulty in translating such intensified and heightened prose images into those of photography. At best, the life essay turned out to be an excellent ad for the book, end quote. I wonder what Gordon Parks felt when he saw, saw that. Ralph Ellison's 1952 groundbreaker novel laid bare visceral experiences of what it meant to embody a black body, a black male body in 20th century America, and the plight of that body when forced to exist in a perpetual liminal space marked by constant tension between visibility, invisibility, and paradoxically hyper-visibility in a racially 
charged landscape. So the curatorial project and exhibition I'm working on, which this talk is based on, looks at the works of key contemporary 21st century artists who continue to find the novel incredibly provocative and timely. And in reimagining Ellison's Invisible Man and their art practices, they have created work that mines Ellison's several book for how it signifies invisibilities we confronted then and we confront now. And so what I'd like to do now is offer a close reading of some of that work and, and from a curatorial framing. This particular body of work is centered on portraiture, the form that Ellison was most drawn to as a photographer and in turn most critically sensitive to. In these works, the black male body is central. The artists reflect on the psychological rather than the physical condition of invisibility in doing so, these works offer a poignant commentary on the social and economic and political dimensions of invisibility. These intergenerational contemporary artists, Carrie James Marshall, Jack Whitten, Mick Smith, and Radcliffe McGroy, invite us to reckon with invisibility through the lens of racial erasure. As you'll see in these portraits, the figures are alone their character studies of what it means to exist and not to exist. So, oh good, this shows how time The Chicago based artist, Carrie James Marshall, who I'm sure many of you know, know or have heard of, currently has a new body of work showing at David Turner here in London. Um, whose art practice over the course of three and a half decades has been committed to honoring and elevating the black body in Western art, was profoundly impacted by Invisible Man when first reading it as a young man himself and as an emerging artist. In response, some of his first works in the early years of his career in the 1980s were a series of paintings directly ignited by his reading and understanding of the novel. So on the left is a portrait of the artist as a shadow of his former self, and is credited as Marshall's first work as an artist. Um, in Marshall's incredible retrospective mounted at the Met in New York City in 2016, this small, humble work opens the exhibition and sets the tone for the arc of the artist's career. And on the right, the 1986 work directly references the book in its title, Invisible Man. In both of these works, as you see, the color black dominates. Marshall uses extreme blackness, the blackness of black sometimes, as he says, as a tool to interpret the novel as that of a psychological invisibility. He notes in an interview for Interview Magazine, quote, in Ellison's case, invisibility is more psychological than it is phenomenal and it's conditioned by anger, animosity, and lack of desire to engage with the black body. There was always simultaneity that had nothing to do with visuality. You can be there and not be there at the same time and be fully visible all the time. That's what really struck me about Ellison. What Marshall does with black paint and black bodies and black skin is exquisite. Indeed, throughout the artist's of war, he's worked to combat the invisibility of blackness by placing extremely black figures as the focus of his work. In the 1980 painting, A Portrait of the Artist, we see a portrait of a black man with black skin, dressed in a black jacket and a black hat, and set before a black background. In the later 1986 work, Invisible Man, we barely see the outline of a looming, enigmatic black figure. His full body may be either emerging or disappearing from a black background. There is certainly a palpable discomfort and unsettling uneasiness in both of these works. They are indeed tough to grapple with. The kind of monstrosity and horror seen here is exactly Marshall's point, to indict the ways blackness has been depicted by an outsider's gaze. What I find fascinating is where, as Ellison said, where the, the role of the viewer's gaze and engagement become. 
becomes critical. So if you're standing in front of this work, as your eyes adjust to the nuance, and depending on where you're standing, the angle that you are, the position you encounter these works, the figures almost disappear because of the painting's layers of blackness. In other words, it is the blackness of the work that results in the figure's resistance to being seen. It is their blackness that renders them almost invisible. Throughout Marshall's body of work, the artist constantly mines and exploits black stereotypes. Indeed, the irony here is that the reason we are able to see these black figures in these works is because the artist invokes a set of racially charged aesthetic gestures, the whites of the eyes and a white, wide grin smile. These elements are meant to conjure the imagery of historically racist cartoons, of black amours, of sambos. And Marshall notes, quote, what I preserve in the figure are those white eyes and white teeth, because that's still connected to the way in which blackness in the extreme has been stigmatized. Art historians note that as a black-on-black -black painter, Kerry James Marshall challenges the visibility of black bodies in the Western pictorial tradition. And like Ellison's protagonist in Invisible Man, Marshall's central protagonist are always painted and represented in his words, quote, unequivocally, emphatically black. Like Ellison, who called out an American literary canon that did not include fully realized and multi-dimensional black characters, so too has Marshall addressed a similar absence and invisibility by inscribing black figures in Western art in what he calls, quote, a counter archive. As you see, Marshall's art of the invisible, so to speak, is rooted in his stunning and skillful use of the expressive color black as a metaphor for invisibility and a charged commentary on how the black body is perceived. He's an artist that has always been conscious of color, social, and political resonance. And he reminds us in the following quote that it was Ellison's novel that started him on the path of using and thinking critically of the color black. In his words, quote, you can be there and not be there at the same time and be fully visible all the time. That's what really struck me about Ellison and that's what led me to start working with figures that were painted black trying to find a way to embody that simultaneous presence and absence, end quote. So while Kerry James Marshall employs and is conscious of the color black and the social resonance, Jack Whitten, who passed away earlier this year, was invested in material as a way to engage with ideas around the black body, labor, and invisibility. In 1994, the year of Ralph Ellison's death, actually, Jack Whitten made this work titled Black Monolith the Second. As a tribute to his friend and the novel that he shared a deep personal and geographic connection with, Whitten identified with Ellison's Invisible Man as he too navigated a landscape of racial turmoil as a black man born in the American South. Like Ellison's protagonist, Whitten too eventually left the South for New York City. Born in Bessemer, Alabama in 1939, Whitten attended Alabama's Tuskegee Institute, which also figures prominently in the novel. And while a student there, Whitten met Martin Luther King, Jr. in 1957. And his commitment to nonviolent activism fueled his move to New York City in 1960 where he began his career as an artist rooted in a deep sense of social conscious art making. So at first glance, Whitten's black monolith deals with the elusive. In full view, we see the shape of a figure. A deeper look at the details reveals that the work is constructed of tiles. Here is the labor and the materials embedded in those tiles that become meaningful to its reading. To construct the elusive figure in this mosaic work on canvas, the artist made tiles composed of acrylic paint and organic materials that included an impressive menu 
of molasses, copper, salt, coal, ash, chocolate, that's interesting, onion, herb, herbs, rust, and eggshell. Witten was always very detailed and specific about his paint cocktails. His mixing of coal and ash to create the tiles points us to his past in the American South. The artist's father worked as a coal miner in Alabama in his boyhood. And so Witten witnessed the exploitation of poor African American men, including his own father and his uncles, as a source of cheap labor for the steel companies that gravitated to his hometown because of its availability of coal. For Witten, labor and invisibility are inextricably intertwined. If we zoom out again from the individual tiles and we've taken the work in full view, the illumination we see radiating from the figure as a result of the contrast between the darker and lighter tiles in the painting. Throughout the novel, Ellison constantly weaved themes of darkness and illumination, using light to function as a device to break through ignorance or invisibility. The illuminating light, of course, alludes to ideas of visibility, but it also invokes one of Witten's favorite passages about light from Invisible Man, which reads, nothing, storm or flood, must get in the way of our need for light, and ever more and brighter light. The truth is the light, and the light is the truth. Next, we move to the photographer, May Smith. And so for Carrie James Marshall, we see his use of color black. For Witten, we see the importance of some, some symbolism of materiality, like coal and ash. And here, the artist, May Smith, turns to shadow and light. You'll recall as a viewer, we struggled to see Marshall's invisible man. And on the other hand, May Smith's invisible man is visible, yet quite ghostly. In this black and white photography work, also titled Invisible Man, we see the ghostly presence of a figure alone as he walks past an empty lot of overgrown grass and down the sidewalk of an empty street in the background. It appears to be evening. The man looks to be wearing a jacket, his hands tucked in his pockets, perhaps insulated from the cold of the night. In this work, invisibility is coupled with desolation and with emptiness. Employing techniques of surrealism, Smith frames her invisible man out of focus, caught between his shadow, which we see on the sidewalk, and the light that illuminates the street. In another surrealist technique, the artist also paints over the print with minimal accents of yellow and red. The bleakness that threatens to overwhelm the scene is disrupted by Smith's use of light and improvisational splashes of color. As we saw with Witten's black monolith, here too Smith engages Ellison's themes of darkness and light as metaphors for the human condition. While Carrie James Marshall's Invisible Man makes pronounce the details of the eyes and mouth and the figure's face, in contrast, here in May Smith's work, we cannot see the details of the figure's face. And yet, his facelessness allows us to feel a sense of isolation and alienation even more deeply. Like Marshall, May Smith acknowledges the, res the resonance of Ellison's novel and her art making by also titling the work uh, Invisible Man as a direct tribute to Ellison. Unlike Witten, she also shares the novel's deep connection to place. Smith has lived in and has been documenting Harlem for over two decades, the very neighborhood where Ellison lived for over 40 years and also set the novel. In a 1971 lecture, Ralph Ellison, citing the axiom geography's fate, noted that, quote, very little attention has been given to the role played by geography in shaping the fate of African Americans. Indeed, he understood this all too well. Place has played an important role throughout Ellison's writing of Invisible Man, Oklahoma and the American Southwest, where he was born, Tuskegee University in Alabama in the South, where he attended school, and Harlem in New York City, where he called home for over 40 years. 
And also, it's an emblem of the Great Migration as African Americans abandoned a racially segregated post-slavery American South, like the state of Alabama, for cities in the North, like New York City. In a 1948 essay, Harlem is Nowhere, Ellison wrote that the Harlem of the time was, quote, the symbol of the Negro's alienation in the land of his birth. In this photograph by Smith, we get a sense that the man's head, his gaze, is tilted to the ground. Smith's invisible man is dejected, burdened by the weary blues. The date of the work, 1998, conjures the Harlem of the 1990s, where after decades of neglect and decline that Ellison addressed in his Harlem's Nowhere essay, the neighborhood began to see the beginnings of rapid gentrification and rising costs of living that disappeared them, forcing longtime residents out. Smith, too, disappears this figure into the night's shadows. Her centering of his ghostly figure in Harlem forces us to pay attention to what he is going through, literally and symbolically. The fact that many African Americans living in Harlem were wrestling with their own economic visibility. The curator Maurice Berger pointedly notes that in making these symbolic ghosts visible in her work, made Smith, quote, suspends her subjects between visibility and invisibility, faces turned away or are blurred or shrouded in shadow, mist or darkness, are a potent metaphor for the struggle for African American visibility in a culture in which black men and women were disparaged, erased, or ignored. And the last work is by Radcliffe Roy. So I've shared the works of Harry James Marshall, Jack Whitten, and Nate Smith that have kind of taken us through this journey of portraits from barely visible to ghostly visible. And in all these contrasts to them, there's probably at first look nothing invisible of this work by Radcliffe Roy. In fact, it's the exact inverse. The figure features, features here is hyper visible. In the opening lines I shared earlier from the prologue of Invisible Man, where Ellison writes, I am invisible simply because people refuse to see me. The line that comes after that is incredibly insightful to Roy's work. Ellison writes, when they approach me, they only see my surroundings, themselves, or figments of their imagination. Indeed, everything and anything except me. This idea that Ellison taps here of the role one's environmental conditions and surroundings play in how one is seen is at the crux of the work of the Jamaican American photographer Radcliffe Roy. He provocatively engages what it means to be hyper visible and invisible at the same time. Equally important, his images illuminate how the hyper visibility of black bodies particularly those of young black men, pervasively stripped of their humanity and dignity, criminalized in the media and television and film and caricatured, think of Carrie James Marshall's works and the gap tooth winning smile, is what renders them invisible. In his own introduction to Invisible Man, Ellison captured this idea, writing that hypervisibility of African Americans are at the time, at the time, resulted in them being, quote, unvisible. Roy conceived of this series, this incredible series of portraits actually taken around the United States. Um, he conceived of this series when living is, is a protest, in his words, quote, as a glimpse into what it means to live in struggle. His work beckons us to question how the 20th century visibility of the black body that Ellison detailed is still very much a 21st century struggle. His portraits are of the real invisible, hyper-visible black men he encounters as he crisscrosses the United States. Roy urges us, the viewer, to see these young men first and foremost in his own photographic method. To make these portraits, he gets very close to these young men to document them. 
He uses a, a 28 millimeter or a 35 millimeter lens, which requires he gets close to their faces, close to their bodies. He eliminates the distance between he and them, and instead welcomes the intimacy and the conversation afforded by their presence. And so the act of getting close is an act of seeing and of countering their invisibility. In this particular portrait in the series, a young man stands in a field of cotton, alluding to the history of plantation slavery in the American South, the labor of black bodies, and the violence done to those bodies from that labor. The young man faces the camera with his hands held up, palms facing outward. Indeed, unarmed black men and heartbreakingly young black children gone down in the hands of police shootings has become a hyper-visible narrative in the United States. In tandem, the hands-up gesture, politically and racially charged posture, has too become hyper-visible. In the summer of 2014, the police shooting of 18-year-old Michael Brown in Ferguson, Missouri, in which eyewitness testimony revealed that before he was killed, he attempted to surrender by raising his hands above his head. This gesture has transformed the hands-up gesture into a universal symbol of protest. So while a viewer might read a stillness or a calmness in this image, this young, as this young man's raised hand conveys an act of surrender, perhaps even compliance, this image is also riddled with double meaning, simultaneously conveying a posture of defiance. Writing on these, the hype, writing on the hyper-visible body in Roy's work, cultural critic Arnett Cottabon writes, Roy pays attention to these communities vying not to be erased, and he looks at them with warmth and directness. In his photos, dignified faces stare at us, us at them, as he beckons us to see too. Hands now ascend to assert dignity, they are no longer merely lifted in limbo, awaiting some sort of pardon, but instead demand recognition, justice, peace. These things, recognition, justice, peace, were the very things Ellison's Invisible Man too demanded. And so to end, I, I wonder what Ellison might have thought of these attempts to visually represent Invisible Man and the nuances of invisibility that he unpacks in the novel. It's a difficult question to answer. And I want to share with you that in the years after the publication of the novel and its wide-ranging success, as you can imagine, Ellison received several proposals to adapt the book. He refused several attempts to turn the novel into a movie. He rejected a proposal that would turn the character into a Marvel comic superhero. Um, and as you recall, he shared in his letter to Richard Wright that he was even disappointed in the final product of the Life magazine portraits, as seen here, a visual representation that he himself guided and shaped with Gordon Parks. Paradoxically, Ellison was not convinced of the visuality of Invisible Man. Literary scholar Lisa Hill posits in her essay, The Visual Art of Invisible Man, that Ellison's novel, quote, constitutes the ultimate abstract portrait through its power to transform the reality of the Invisible Man's experiences into a comprehensive picture of his humanity. For Ellison, though, only words hold the capacity for such a feat. End quote. So given all that to bear, I am optimistic these 21st century visual representations, I think, offer us the gift of meditating on a profound question. And perhaps it's the question that mattered most at Ralph Ellison's Invisible Man. And that generous and affirming question simply is, who are you? Thank you.